This is the fifth estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 14th of July, 2020, and I am 2J. I am JM. And I am GK. And in case you missed the headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, COVID, lives and stories of the ones we have lost. In the Standard, how to fix the school's crisis. And the star, JP Billions, at center of Uhuru divorce. Mm. Yes. And I suspect we start there with the yeah. divorce. So a few days ago, Caleb uh, Kosatan, the Deputy Secretary General of the Jubilee Party, wrote a letter demanding to be furnished with audited accounts of the Jubilee Party for the last several years. Mm. And he addressed this letter to Tudru. Uh, but in a swift rejoinder, uh, <laughs> Tudru uh, responded by saying the Office of the Auditor General has given the party a clean bill of health, mm -hmm. that the public documents which um, uh, he's asking for uh, are actually with the political uh, uh, party's tribunal uh, or, or that, that agency, yeah. mm. uh, together with the Office of the Auditor General, those are public documents and the documents which um, are accessible to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he also said that um, uh, he, he didn't have very kind words for mm -hmm. Caleb. <laughs> to and so, and so, uh, yeah, to Drew, that is. Yeah. And so let me just quote what he said. He said, your latest letter demanding documentation from the office of the Secretary General, where you are the deputy and you proceed to give an ultimatum of seven days, is puzzling, if not, uh, if not some rather desperate political <laughs> posturing. <laughs> and then he proceeded to call him a megalomaniac, uh -huh. <laughs> somebody who's obsessive with a desire for power. Yeah. There's a few things here uh, by way of commentary that I just want to say. The first is uh, the, the cardinal error that uh, uh, Ruto's men seem to be doing here. Mm. Is that they, they, they're attempting to command what they cannot enforce mm. in the Jubilee party. So they have neither command nor control of the party. Mm. They're issuing threats in vain. And yeah. uh, that way they b very rapidly lose power. And using the same letterheads as I, Jubilee. Yes, I, just, I know, it looks so ridiculous. Same, <laughs> same letterheads, precisely. Uh, yeah. and, and the second thing, as Margaret Thatcher said, power yeah. is like being a lady. And if you have to tell people you are, then you aren't. Mm. And this is, this is uh, what they're trying to do. Yeah. You know, they're trying to assert them, uh, themselves by saying that, yes, we are powerful, we're yeah. the ones in charge. Yeah. But actually, you yeah. know, they're not. Uh, yeah. they're, these are the I kicks think it's of fantastic. A and receiving yeah. a well-written letter that is layered in insults that you have to kind of double read again, yeah. I, I thought yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so is this mm. a DP's tactic to divide and conquer from within? He's, mm. he's so attempting, but he will fail ultimately. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if Jubilee comes out on top because you wouldn't want them to fight and then an outsider takes, um, you know, capitalizes on their disaster, yeah, if, any, if there will be one. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a few part criteria that we're going to use to break down the headlines. We're going to ask ourselves, is it topical or speculative? Is it repetitive or groundbreaking? And is it thoughtful or just plain lazy? Mm -hmm. um, I thought this was topical. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a little bit speculative because yeah. we are not really sure that there are billions at the center of, of this divorce, yeah. although mm -hmm. there is large amounts of money at yeah. the yeah. hand. Um, but we can pack it, I think. Yes, enough, agreed. As an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Let's move to the Daily Nation, where COVID um, uh, lives and stories of the ones we have lost. Mm. So Daily Nation has put a moving piece together about the people um, who've um, passed on from or been affected by uh, COVID-19. Yeah. And so they ask, you probably have been um, asking, do you know or anyone knows someone who has died of COVID-19? Yeah. And the reality is that as this progresses, we're all likely to know at least one person. It's um, getting closer. Yeah, mm -hmm. That is going to be infected or has passed on from the disease. Mm -hmm. um, so they say that from March 28th, when the first death occurred, we are now at 197 deaths. Mm. Um, and though mortality rate is low, they yeah. say that, you know, this is still a huge impact for yeah. our society. It is. And they say that, you know, the deaths are affecting males more than females at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and more so those with pre-existing conditions yeah. such as diabetes so they go on to put into context kenya yeah. um in kenyan households according to the national bureau of statistics has 15 percent um of a, uh, each have a member who is ailing from diabetes wow. and 18.5 percent have a member with pre-existing medical medical mm. conditions such as um, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. heart disease, or high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, they note this um, phenomenon of the super spreader. And those are mm -hmm. young Kenyans who are super spreaders because they're active, they're moving around. Yeah. Um, and uh, in cases like South Africa, they've decided to ban alcohol. 
mm. uh, so as to deal with what is making these young people convene. Mm -hmm. If we get rid of that, are we gonna get, have people sort of staying, staying in home. their spaces? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's see. I don't know if it's an idea that can work in Kenya. I don't think Bad it would idea. work here. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can't separate Kenyans from their drinks. Yeah. But good story from the Daily Nation. Yes, Very most moving. definitely. Um, yeah. And so we won't toss it because it is in memory of those um, who've been affected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the encouraging thing is that uh, the overwhelming majority of cases yeah. are mild cases. Are mild yes, cases. yes, yes. Will recover. Yeah. 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 But Precisely. still stay safe. The stay safe. Yeah, it's no excuse you. yeah, to have it. So in the standard? The standard, of course, continuation with the education um, scandal, with what they're trying to deal with in the light of corona. Mm. They say in the standard, education experts have criticized the government for failing to explore options that would have ensured learners progress to the next class instead of, you know, being held back for a year. Mm. And so we all know sco uh, schools are being held back until 2021. Mm. Yeah. And so in the standard, they outline three proposals that they think the education ministry did not address. Mm -hmm. The first one is that they should have worked out a, fo a formula for students to transition and recover what they have lost in this time period. Mm. The second is to um, tap into the learners' cap capitation funds and equip them with tablets and laptops to do virtual learning. Yeah. And the third is to just simply find a way for school to start in September rather than in January. But I think all experts are unanimous that physical learning should not take place. Yeah. Everybody needs to um, stay at home while they do their learning, however feasible or not feasible that may be. Mm. But they're suspended, um, or rather they're not sure yeah. whether um, shifting the academic year to start in January is mm. a good idea. It's a good idea. Yeah, I think if we learn from other countries, India allowed students to skip a whole year. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the US, they did online yeah. exams. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I there's think ways around this. There are ways around it. Mm. I think that there just needs to be room for negotiation. Yeah, the time and creativity. Creativity. The time between now and January, it's yeah. quite a bit of time. We can find a way to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So who do we give our winning headline? Personally, I like the Daily Nation. We should keep it. Um, but I think the saucier headline is the Jubilee divorce <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. and the billions that are at the center of it. I agree. Yeah. All right. So yeah. let's give it to the star as yes. our winning headline. On to the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country, where we also have a three-part criteria. We ask ourselves, is it humorous or dry? Is it satirical or pessimistic? And is it effective or just plain lazy? Mm. So if we begin with the Daily Nation. Yep. We have uh, a uh, Uhuru, a character of Uhuru, we think it's Uhuru, mm -hmm. as a shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> and he is guiding his sheep, apparently, uh, to gamble on their health by reopening the country. We don't know. But mm. so the caption says, I say we gamble and reopen. And the sheep say, ah, ah <laughs> And he's holding uh, the Bible, a staff, sheep, sheep on the, he has a sheep on his head. He, he has ha a key. <laughs> he has a key, he has many things yeah. going on. Um, interesting. And I, I think, you know, we expected that the cases would rise yeah. as mm. the country opened up. Mm -hmm. um, th that was expected. This wasn't yes. a shock. And he prepared us for that very for that, thing. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is what True. he called cautious optimism. Exactly. Yeah. And at yeah. the end of the day, life has to continue. We can't yeah. be held uh, hostage by the virus. Exactly. And that's his rationale. And I think it will pay off. Exactly. Mm. So let's see how this goes. In the standard. In the standard, we have a little bit of a comic strip from Gadot. In the first box, we have, Baba has deserted us. In the second, no, those are just malicious rumors. The third, Baba will be joining us very soon. And in the fourth, he just took a detour to Dubai. He'll be back um, to take us to Canaan. <laughs> and then Gadot's little guy at the bottom is saying, I hear there is milk, honey, vodka, and COVID-19 vaccines in Canaan. <laughs> Baba is the answer to all our problems. All of the problems, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I don't know if he's likening the Israelites to the Luo nation, or is that the whole of you know the Kenyan population? Yeah, I don't know, but it, yeah, <laughs> the people's president. Yeah. Anyway, he's yeah. back now, so let's see whether BBI will get movement, uh, yeah. as well yes. as all these other was there, <laughs> was there vodka in Canaan? I don't <laughs> Maybe wine. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, let's... Which, which takes us to our next cartoon. Yeah. While Baba was away. Yeah. So this is a caricature of Ryla walking through a revolving door. He's waving at the audience. And the relevance here is that uh, on his arrival back from Dubai, Odinga is now expected to join the president in launching the final report of mm. the BBI yeah. uh, uh, initiative. And so th that's uh, this is basically it. He's going to be uh, the flag bearer of that mm. process. And this is what the cartoon is depicting. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, I found it a little... It's oh, weird. Is it go is, 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 yeah. is Rao going round Something. in circles? Will we have an end to BBI? Because a revolving yeah. door never really ends. You just keep Well, going. that's a good point. That's yeah, a good yeah point you just keep GK. going round and yeah. round. Yeah. And if you think nothing is impossible, try slamming a revolving door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we give it our winning cartoon? 
Oh, what do you think? Why not? For some food for thought. Okay, food for thought. Maybe <laughs> the audience can explain to us what this cartoon what is really about. <laughs> oh, there we go, Ozan. Uh, from the start, gives us our winning cartoon. And now for our final thought. But before we do, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Mm. And now our final thought. Today is inspired by a book entitled Dead Aid. Mm -hmm. Why aid is not working and how there is a better way for Africa. Written by a Zambian author, Dambisa Moyo, in 2009. So she says in this book that foreign aid is hurting Africa. That money from rich countries has trapped many African countries in a cycle of corruption, slower economic growth and poverty. And she suggests that cutting off this flow would be far more beneficial to us. And so she asks, is aid just an extension of colonial economics? Or is it a lifeline for imperfect but necessary support systems? And this is a proposal that she tries to make in the book. Mm. So her line of argument is as follows. Over the last few decades, donors have pumped billions, if not trillions, of dollars of aid into Africa. Meanwhile, the number of poor people in the region has continued to rise. So why has so much money done so little good? And so this idea of calling aid dead may be controversial, but it carries a very important message. She says that the lives of billions rest on getting the right financial solutions to the problems of developing nations. And after more than six decades um, of the wrong diagnosis, it's now time to turn the corner and find the harder but better role. Mm. And so her main premise is that aid itself is the cause of a lot of our problems, that it creates a culture of dependency on foreign handouts, and that we end I'm um, living in cultures that are rife with corruption. And so she produces a lot of statistical and anecdotal evidence aimed at showing that aid chokes economic growth, sus um, sponsors corruption, and, sponsor, sorry, and fosters financial dependence on foreign donors. Mm. And so she says that governments then end up with this dilemma. Why should you tax your citizens when you have access to easy money? And so she says that since the inception of this idea of financial aid, um, we end up being pulled into this global financial system or global capitalistic system, but then you have the West also relying on us. So based on the fact that this book was written in 2009, I'll give some more updated statistics. Um, according to a 2014 report, Africa receives about 133 billion each year in mm. official aid. Mm. But at the same time, 191 billion is extracted from the continent in terms of debt repayments, mm. multinational company profits, illicit financial flows, brain drain, and illegal um, fishing and logging. And so her solution is that instead of us being obsessed with aid, we should try to um, look for fair trade agreements. But actually, her biggest solution is to turn to China. And I think that looking at this book, um, 11 years later, I think we know the consequences or the en what ends up happening when you invest with China. <laughs> and so her argument may be hard to swallow. I think there's a bit of um, illogical fallacies that are applied. But I think nevertheless, it's a unsettling book with optimistic solutions. Mm. And I think ultimately, she's trying to challenge some of the development aid mentality that we've kind of operated with for the past 60 odd years. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's an interesting read to kind of look at a different perspective. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible that she was angling for a job with China? <laughs> And this is why Maybe. she's trying to tell yeah. the African continent. It's very possible. And I hear she was yeah. look to China. And she was uh, Kagame's very good uh, advisor. Advisor. For many uh, years. All right. <laughs> so let me yeah. build on what you've mentioned to Jay. Let me expand on the relationship between aid and corruption. Mm. Uh, but before I do so, in this part that deals with uh, this relationship, the author begins with a dose of humor. And uh, this is a story about uh, the, the former high commissioner uh, to Kenya of Britain. Uh, Sir Edward Clay, mm. who talked about, very candidly talked about mm. corruption in Kenya in the year 2004. And so he remarked, Kenya's corrupt ministers were eating like gluttons and vomiting on the shoes of the foreign donors. <laughs> now, in, in February 2005, <laughs> she says, when he was prodded to make a public apology for that statement, he gave uh, a sarcastic uh, apology, saying he was sorry for the moderation of his language and for underestimating the scale of the looting <laughs> and for failing to speak out earlier. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very candid remarks. Uh -huh. I do recall that, that they created quite a hullabaloo yeah. uh, with the government at that period of time. Mm. Uh, but moving on, the author speaks about the vicious cycle of aid in developing nations. And according to her, there are three principal drawbacks for, uh, for aid uh, for Africa's poor economies. 
Uh, the first is that it creates that culture of dependency you mentioned to Jay, uh, where leaders perpetually look f uh, to cheap and accessible financing from abroad. Mm. Mm. Second, because African governments, she says, are inherently corrupt, uh, when donor funds are injected into the system, they continue to be misused, creating a bad reputation for the government, yep. uh, which starves the country, therefore, of much needed domestic and foreign investment. Uh, hence, creating a vicious cycle where there are fewer investment, uh, fewer investments, there's reduced economic growth, uh, fewer job opportunities, and mm. increased uh, poverty levels. Additionally, she says, African countries uh, can behave with impunity because donor institutions such as the World Bank uh, have little incentive in punishing countries that <laughs> misuse aid, let alone mm. even using it uh, effectively, or mis uh, using it in, in, in a non-effective manner. And so with a collective staff of about 500,000 people across the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions, and international donor organizations, she says there's an incredible amount of pressure to keep lending irregardless mm. of how the funds are being used. Mm. And finally, number three, is uh, brain drain and a corruption of the good apples in mm. our countries. And so she says, in an aid-dependent environment, the talented and better educated, more principled people who should be building the foundations of economic prosperity either become unprincipled and are drawn from productive work towards bribery, mm. or if they choose to remain principled, they are driven away to the private sector or abroad, mm. leaving the posts that remain to be filled by the relatively less educated and potentially <laughs> more thieving, uh, uh, you know, sort Left of people. Us, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so that's why she says aid is, is bad for it's us. It's bad for us. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> So I met her in 2009 when the book came out mm. and she was a polarizing figure even then, you know, mm. because she was taking on a whole industry, like you're saying, that relies on, you know, aid, yeah. giving out this aid. Um, but I think one of the criticisms is it's easy to say aid is bad or good, mm. but I think what um, one critic asks us to do is to ask the counterfactual question, mm. which is what would have happened without aid? Yeah. Um, you know, if you just pulled it out of, of Africa, what would be the situation? And I think therein lies the compromise, why you would want aid in some areas, especially mm. in healthcare. Um, we have the eradication of malaria, yeah. mainly through aid, because government was not committing money or research mm. um, to eradicating um, mm -hmm. stuff like this, right? Um, and then there's also a catch-22. Do donors give up on uh, those poor people stuck with bad governments? So mm. the idea, ideal model would be that aid would only go to places where there would be no wastage, corruption, bribery. But there's poor people at the bottom of this yeah. uh, cadre that actually really need, uh, need this that. help, yeah. right? Yeah, help. So I see it as a there's a double-edged sword there. Mm. Um, but I love that Moyo saw opportunities, um, which is what Tujay was telling us, in the global capital markets, in uh, foreign investment, in entrepreneurship. In fact, she gives two examples of entrepreneurship neural success stories. There's a man named Alia Conte uh, who started a billion dollar cell phone company in the middle of a uh, civil war in the DRC. Mm. Mm. Um, and you have Kenyan entrepreneurs in tumultuous electoral times taking over 40% of the European uh, market in cut flowers. And mm. that was at that time. Yeah. And I'm sure those numbers are much bigger yeah. now. Mm -hmm. But those stories sometimes for me are so far and few in between, right? Mm. Not everybody mm. can have billion dollar um, enterprise. Yeah. Um, but her solution is trade. How can we increase mm. the volumes within the continent? And so she says that um, if you're going to give aid, let's give aid that uh, facilitates tra trade across borders. Yeah. Um, and this means investing majorly in transport infrastructure, roads, ports, internal container depots, inland waterways, mm. railways, right? Um, and I want to highlight one thing, the transnational highways of Africa, mm. and particularly Trans Highway Number 8, yeah. which is actually from Lagos to Mombasa and vice versa. It's mm. what connects, it's a principal route that connects east to west yeah. um, for us. Um, so it's not enough for Uhuru Kenyatta or the president of Nigeria to just um, develop within, it's important to have connectors between these two countries. Mm. Um, and I think once mm. we create a single economic space, yes. will Africa prosper? And we see that there's goodwill. We already know that there's an Africa continental free, free trade, trade agreement. area yeah. agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Some countries have not signed on, but I mm. think people should sign on. Just like the EU created that economic bloc, so can we. Yeah. And then when it no longer works for us, we can step back, step out mm. and, and now engage in comparative advantage. Mm. 
mm. and things like mm. like that. Yeah. Um, so I think still food for thought. It's still a hot debate uh, many mm. years on um, it's very from true. her. Yeah. Yeah. So on a day where we had a winning headline from the star and a winning cartoon from the star, I want to leave you with this from Dambi Samoyo. She says, a constant stream of free money is a perfect way to keep an inefficient or a simply bad government in power. As aid flows in, there is nothing more for government to do, she says. It doesn't need to raise taxes, and as long as it pays the army, mm. it doesn't have to take into account any of its disgruntled citizens. Mm. So by all means, yeah. keep your government on its toes. Yes. Um, and let's look to the free markets. I yeah. think there's a lot to learn from looking east. A lot of countries have prospered. Mm. Um, and yeah. So keep government on your toes. Mm -hmm. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, but also find us on TV. We're on GoTV, Pankita, and Star Times. Have a lovely evening.